Here's the secret to getting fit, getting good grades, and becoming a confident public speaker. Classical conditioning. Something discovered by Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov in the early 1900s. Pavlov was collecting dog saliva. When he discovered the dogs would salivate not only in response to food, but in response to things associated with food. In a series of experiments Pavlov conditioned the dogs to salivate in response to neutral stimulus, such as a metronome, a bell, or a light bulb. From these experiments, we understand the process of classical conditioning to have the following parts. So, let's unpack what these parts are exactly, by examining Pavlov's experimental procedures. First Pavlov repeatedly exposed the dogs to two stimuli together. This is the unconditional stimulus because even without the conditioning process, it induced a response. It makes the dogs drool. This is the conditional stimulus because it needs the help of the conditioning process to create a response. Nothing about a thousand hertz tone is inherently delicious, but with conditioning it induces the same response as the unconditional stimulus. As the two stimuli are presented together repeatedly, the dogs undergo a process known as acquisition where they learn to associate tone with the food and the response of drooling become not only an unconditional to food, but a conditional response to the conditional stimuli. All you need to do is play the beep to make the dogs drool. With this model, let's look at some common examples of this phenomenon. For example, much of advertising depends on classical conditioning. Often ads are used to associate a company's logo with some desirable stimuli, be it cute, sexy, wholesome, or so on. For example, if you show a logo of a cute animal that makes you happy, after you undergo acquisition the logo will also makes you feel happy. Note that advertising can also often makes use of higher order conditioning in which a conditional stimulus is used as an unconditional stimulus for another conditional stimulus. For example a company's logo can be associated with the new product so that the new product promises the same feelings associated with the logo. So say that you often see a logo for a fitness company next to someone super beautiful and happy, and let's say that when you see these ads you unconsciously compare yourself to the physical appearance of that person, and maybe you feel a little inadequate. Every time you see the logo next to their fitness drink in the store, you may subconsciously remember feeling inadequate. If the ads campaigns and the packaging do their job well, you might then decide to buy the drink, even though it probably tastes very bad, and won't actually makes you beautiful or happy. But, hold on. Classical conditioning might actually be able to help you to become more conventionally attractive and maybe even more happy, and here's how. A few times a week, for about a month, go to the gym and don't exercise. Just pick a few regular times a week, and go there. Read some magazines, a book, do something that makes you feel relaxed. Have some fun. Use the gym as a place to unwind. This way you'll associate the conditional stimulus of the gym with the unconditional stimulus of relaxation and fun, and going to the gym will create the conditional response of feeling happy and relaxed. So, you'll want to go there on a regular basis, and you'll be able to keep up the consistent schedule required to achieve your workout goals. After you have undergone such a regime, you might be able to also take advantage here of higher order conditions to make yourself more happy, since, if you feel more happy when you go to the gym and you train when you go to the gym, then you might eventually feel happy whenever you train, wherever you train. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You can use a similar classical conditioning technique to improve your studying habits. Every time you study drink a peppermint tea, and while drinking just study. No distractions. Only take a break once you finish the tea. Over time, you'll learn to associate the peppermint tea with focusing on your studies, so that all you need to focus is to drink some tea. You also might have heard a similar tip of having a specific place in your house or at the library where you consistently study and focus, so that, all you need to do to focus is to go to that location. But, be careful. 
This technique is vulnerable to the process that comes after acquisition, extinction. If you start checking social media regularly in your study area, or drinking tea whenever you want, your conditional response will fade. Pavlov observed this process in his dogs. If you presented the conditional stimulus alone for several trials, the conditional response would diminish. But, after extinction there's another process that might help you get your focus back. Spontaneous recovery. As observed in Pavlov's dogs, if after some extended time, the conditional stimulus is brought back, then the conditional response will reappear. But if you don't reinforce it with the unconditional stimulus then it will go through a second extinction period. So get off your phone and keep studying. What's notable about the spontaneous recovery process is that it shows that the conditioned learning is not removed forever in the extinction process. Rather, the subject learns that the conditional stimulus no longer predicts the unconditional stimulus for now. But, with some time, it might come to be predicted again. You might also be able to use extinction to your advantage to cope with phobias. As observed in several studies, classical conditioning is one way to explain the emergence of phobias. In studies where lab rats are conditioned to associate some neutral stimulus, like a noise, with some negative stimulus, like a shock, rats are observed to develop fearful behavior towards the neutral stimulus and towards the area where the experiment was conducted. They developed phobias of the noise and of the chambers. Alternately, conditioning could cause a fear of public speaking. So, during a big career-making or breaking presentation, your slides went dead and you forget the rest of your speech, and you could do nothing. This experience would probably make you associate the unconditional stimulus of embarrassment, shame, and despair with the conditional stimulus of public speaking. But, remember, extinction happens when the subject is exposed to the conditional stimulus without the unconditional stimulus. So, if you practice public speaking in front of a sympathetic audience, if everything goes all right a few times in a row, then that fear might go away. In fact, if it goes really well, you might even develop a positive association. But, it's likely that the best you can hope for is just a bit of state fright, but, nothing that you can't deal with. Note that a phobia, like a fear of public speaking, probably have some degree of generalization. Generalization happens when stimuli that are similar to the conditional stimulus generates the conditional response. For example, Pavlov's dogs reproduce saliva in response to tones that were close in frequency to the trained tones, that is, the response was generalized to the surrounding tones, and the more similar the stimulus, the stronger the response. After our hypothetical disaster presentation, if you did develop a fear of public speaking, then this conditioned behavior has undergone some generalizations. You didn't previously have a bad experience at every podium and stage in existence, only at your unlucky presentation. But now a situation similar to that presentation are enough to pump that conditional response. In other words, your one bad experience on the podium has caused you to generalize that all public speaking situations will end in disaster. In contrast to generalization, discrimination in classical conditioning refers to when a conditioned response occurs only after a conditional stimulus, not after a stimulus that is similar. In this graph we can see that Pavlov's dogs do demonstrate some degree of discrimination. Although they respond to tones that are very similar to the conditional stimulus, they are able to discriminate these primary tones from tones that are not as similar to conditional stimulus, and they probably wouldn't respond to just any noise of Pavlov plays. That is, their response would discriminate between different noises. So, if the failed presentation happened to someone with more past experience, like speaking like a professional performer, they might only develop a fear of speaking in that location or about that subject, but be able to perform fine in other venue and on other topics. 
In this case the conditional response shows a higher degree of discrimination, since the conditional response only responds to the original conditional stimulus, and not to the similar stimuli. Finally, there are a few more subtitles to unpack about classical conditioning. We'll do so with the help of John Garcia's taste aversion studies. Garcia first gave rats a flavored solution, then sometime later subjected them to radiation, which induced nausea. After only a single trial this nausea caused the rats to develop a taste aversion to the solution. This happens even if the rats were irradiated a few hours after they consumed the solution. This study demonstrated that classical conditioning can occur after only a single trial, and even with long delay between the conditional stimulus and the unconditional stimulus. But, note that this study also demonstrated that these discoveries are not true of all instances of conditioning. That is acquisition is easier and faster with some sets of stimuli than with others. For example, food and illness are easier to associate with each other than noise and illness. Alternately, whereas it might only take one bad experience to give use of your stage fright it'll probably take long-term and repeated efforts to make some magic focus tea and to make you love going to the gym.